chapter 16 and verse number 33. The Bible says, I have told you these things so that me that ye might have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I just want to give for our message this morning, cheer up. Cheer up. Y'all know we live in a very negative society. And, and, and the news seems to always focus on the things that have gone wrong. And they seem to seldom to talk about the things that are going on that are right in the world. Now, even your friends, they always they come and tell you some good stuff sometimes, but most of the stuff they bring you is always some doom and gloom. Somebody sick, you heard who was in the hospital. Child, you heard such and such died. We always got some kind of doom and gloom news that we can bring. But I want to encourage us as the people of God that we ought to be of good cheer. We ought to be of good cheer. As Christians, we should be of good cheer most of all because we are children of God. We look at the bigger picture. We recognize that we live in in this world and we are going to suffer tribulation from time to time but the bigger picture is that at the end result of that thing God is going to deliver us from them all he told us in the scripture that many are the not few but many are the, the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all you ought to remember what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 beginning at verse number 4 he said rejoice in the Lord sometimes oh. now he said rejoice in the Lord all Ways, and again I say rejoice. I believe he said that second time so just in case you forget why you're in the middle of a storm this is what you need to do. You need to rejoice and again I say rejoice. He said let your gentleness be known to all men the Lord is at hand be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus finally brother whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are noble whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there be any virtue you, and if there be anything praiseworthy, he said, you ought to meditate on these Thank things. Yeah. What is Paul doing, church? Paul is teaching us why we should be people that always have a reason to rejoice. Obviously, we should rejoice simply because we are in the Lord. I said we ought to rejoice, number one, simply because we are in the Lord. I didn't say you was outside of Christ, but you are in the Lord on tonight. And we are saved people, and we are looking forward to the hope of heaven one of these days. And we can know with all confidence that God loves us and that he will be there for us in our times of need. But when you start struggling, I didn't say if, when you start struggling... Paul says that we ought to rejoice and he tells us that we need to pray to God and we need to turn our problems over to the Lord and let him handle it. Now, the thing is, when you do that, when you turn your problems over to the Lord and you allow God to handle your problems, it will bring us peace because we know God is listening to our problems. He's listening to our requests and not only is he listening, but in due time, he's going to give us the answer that we're looking for. Now, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James says it like this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, James let you know you weren't just going to face one kind of trial. James let you know you weren't just going to experience one kind of trouble in your life. He said, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect word that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, this may sound foreign to us, but James says that we should count it all joy. When we fall into various trials. Now, they don't sound like good sense to us, but James said you ought to count it all joy. And why? Because it produces patience. Yes. If nothing else, you learn how to wait on the Lord. You learn how to trust 
in the Lord. You learn how to depend on his understanding and his wisdom in all the things that you do. Yes, now, now, when you look through the Bible, you'll see over and over again, you know, many people experience all kinds of trials that they went through, but at the end result of it, it caused their faith to grow stronger in the Lord. And that should be the end result of the trials of Christians today. That once you get out of something, you ought to be able to say that your faith has been made stronger. You ought to be able to say that you are a stronger believer because God has allowed you to go through it. And not just because he allowed you to go through it, but he made a way for you to get out of it. Amen. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul said, man, you need to put up with the little stuff you're going to have to face with down on this earth. Because the little bit of stuff that you're fighting and facing on earth is only working out, preparing you for a greater glory that the Lord has prepared for them that love him. So don't be so quick to run away from your trouble. Don't be so quick to throw in the towel when you are facing adversity and snares in this life. Because at the end result of it, you are going to be made better. Amen. Now, since problems seem to always somehow, you know, sometimes no fault of our own, pop up in our lives. Let's look at some examples of problems that some had in the Bible. And let's see how we can learn from them. The first example I want to give is that of Moses. Moses, we heard about him in Numbers chapter 11, beginning at verse number 11, and on down to verse number 15, the Bible says, So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? We talked about this a couple Sundays ago, if y'all remember. He said, Did I conceive all these people? Did I forget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries her nursing child to the land which you swore to your fathers? Where am I going to get meat to feed all these folks? I ain't got it, God. We for their weeping saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. But if I have found favor in your sight, then do not let me see my wretchedness. Moses was at his wit's end, church. Moses was fed up with dealing with us. Moses was tired. He was overwhelmed, church, because he had been given a great responsibility over these people. And all they did was complain. All they did was grumble. All they did was mumble. He was so sick of it that he asked God to take his life. Now you know you trouble when you ask God to take your life because you're sick of folk. Some that may have been in Moses' shoes may have just given up and walked away from it all. But Moses did not do that. Even though he was feeling overwhelmed, church, he went to God in prayer and he told God about what he was feeling. He told God about what he was dealing with. And notice God's response beginning at verse number 16 now to 17. So the Lord said to Moses, gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and with you there, I will take of the spirit that is in you and will put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you don't have to bear it by yourself. Church, God will allow us, God will not allow us to bear more than we are able to handle. So if you are dealing with something, don't ever say you can't handle it. You can handle it because if you can handle it, God wouldn't have gave it to you in the first place. In this example, he shared Moses' responsibility with 70 other men that were in the company of Moses. We can rest assured that if we are struggling and we pray to God and we pay attention to the Lord, then the Lord will provide us with relief when we need it. Now, our next example comes from Joshua. When he was about to defeat I in Joshua chapter 7, beginning at verse number 4, it says, So about 300,000 men went up from there from the people, but they fled before the men of I. And the men of I struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebrim and brought them back on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. 
Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face because the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua says, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought these people over the Jordan and all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we would have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? <laughs> Joshua was expecting an easy win against this small group of people. But when it did not happen, Joshua started blaming God because he got defeated. He started blaming God because he lost. Sometimes God is the first person that people choose to blame when stuff go wrong. Y'all know that, right? I know you ain't never done it, but I'm talking about the other folk, the folk on the screen. I'm talking about folk across the street. You know, you know, you know. Sometimes we blame God when things go wrong, but if we would take a closer look at the situation, we may find out something else or somebody else is really to blame for the situation. Now this is this is Joshua found this is how Joshua found it when he prayed to God because God tells him what the real problem is. Begin at verse number ten. So the Lord said to Joshua, "Get up! Why are you laying down on your face? Uh -huh. Israel has sinned, uh -huh. and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things." And have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing among you. That's, that's some heavy stuff right there. That's some heavy stuff right there. God telling them just like a T I E S. He didn't cut no corners with them. So sin was what was keeping them from defeating their enemies. As soon as they took care of the sin, then they were able to defeat them. Now, when problems happen in our life, do not ever blame God for it, but instead realize that God is there to help you and to make it to where you can be of good cheer during the problems that you are facing. Now, another example of a man who found himself in trouble was the prophet Elijah. Now, shortly after he killed all those false prophets down there in Baal, Jezebel was after him and he felt like he was all alone. And in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 4, the Bible says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my fathers. Even when God was in his presence, he said in verse number 14, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek also to take my life. Yeah. Preacher, I don't know. If I would have been Elijah, I probably would have been on the first wagon out of town. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. I can't say what I would and wouldn't do. I can't say that. <laughs> How many times, though, have you felt like Elijah and thought you were alone with your problem, yeah. thought you were by yourself, and that nobody else cared about what you was dealing with? Right. Though Elijah felt this way, he was not alone, church, because God was right there with him. And listen how God responds to him, again in verse 14, down to verse 18. It says, Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, though there were 7,000 others that shared this cause, 
even if they were none, Elisha still would not have been alone because God was on his side. And let me tell you, church, as long as you got God on your side, you always the majority. You, you are always on the winning side as long as you are on the side of the Lord. Now, you can rest assured that your problem is not really unique. There's nothing unique about your problem because somewhere, somewhere, somebody else is dealing with the same thing, if not worse than what you are going through. Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 9. Resist him. Steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. What that mean? You ain't no different than nobody else. We all going through something. Everybody dealing with something. Now, as we get back on our example of Elijah, we learn that God basically tells him, stop sitting there and self pity Stop wallowing in there. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and get up and get back to work. If we all do this and med all we do is meditate on a problem and we don't do anything to deal with it or to get our mind off of it, it's going to consume your mind. It's going to consume your time. And so the best thing we can do is to get busy and to continue living our lives for the Lord. Be of good cheer is something that we got to train ourselves to do. That's not something that's just going to happen. Because y'all know life, as we say it, ain't always fair. Life, life doesn't always go the way that we want it to go. And even you can be leaving out of here high off of a Sunday morning, just had an awesome worship experience. Somebody can call you with something that just changed your whole day, that just changed your whole mood. You can run into somebody through conversation, something can happen that can change your whole mood. But as long as you keep in mind who you are, who you are serving, for what reason you are serving, and the end result of it, child of God, you ought to be of good cheer. Amen. I want to share a poem with you that was written. It's an unknown writer. It's called The Deacon's Thanksgiving. This is for you, Deacon. The Deacon's Thanksgiving. It, it was written back in the 1800s, so I'm going to say it like it was written. So don't think I'm talking, you know, kind of written like that. I'm just, I'm just say it how it was written. It said, Old Deacon Bedale was the cheeriest man you'd ever meet within many a day. He loathed that the Lord had a pretty good plan for running the world, he said. I'm thankful that things are about as they are. They could be a mighty worse, you see. And the things we complain of the loudest so far have proved to be a blessing to us. When others lamented the drought, he replied, it's better than having a flood. And we ought to thank God when the weather is dry that we don't have to wallow in the mud. Yet when it was a storm, he never complained. But say with an immutable trust, the Lord in his goodness has sent this rain to lay down this discomforting dust. When adversity smote him, it fell like the dew on a mountain's impervious crest. For his simple philosophy held to the view that everything would work out for the best. And for others' misfortunes, he always finds such a sweet consolation to give. It seemed that he envied the halt and the blind and the lives they were destined to live. One day he was caught in a threshing machine. It cost him a leg, but he said, that's cheaper off than some I've seen. I'm thankful that it wasn't my head. And always thereafter, he stopped on a peg or patiently went with the crutch, declaring, I saved a lot on that leg. My socks only cost me half as much. <laughs> when his end was approaching, he said with a smile as they folded his hands on his breast, I worked pretty hard a considerable while, and I'm thankful to finally get some good rest. So he went through the world, strewing smiles along the way, and the neighbors surviving him tell that no matter what happened, it always seemed every day to be thanksgiving to Deacon Ezra Bell. Now that's the kind of attitude that we ought to have. I think that we ought to be like him sometimes, young that no matter what you are dealing with, you always can find something to be happy about. No matter how dark the night may seem to be, you can always find something that the Lord has done that will shed some light on your situation. No matter what you are dealing with, it ain't that bad. You still alive, it ain't that bad. It hasn't taken you out of here, it ain't that bad. Whatever you are dealing with, you ought to be of good cheer. Why ought to be of good cheer? Because he had already overcome the world. And if he had power to overcome the world, I'm sure he can help me overcome this little stuff that I'm dealing with. 
Now, like this poem I just read to y'all, you can find good in everything. Yes. Yes. In the, even in the worst situation, yes. you can find something good in it. And the more we focus on, that's the thing, you got to stop focusing on the negative and start thinking positive. I'm a big affirmations person. You know, I, even at sometimes you got to get to a place, even in your car, even just take you writing the scripture down on a sticky note and put it on your dashboard. That'll help you out sometimes. Right. If you put, put it on your refrigerator, put it on every mirror in your house, everywhere you go. So even when those moments come when you're feeling defeated as if you can't do it, you can always look to the word of God and say, I remember that word. The Lord said, he never put more on me than I am able to be. I remember that word that he was wounded for my transgression, that he was bruised for my iniquity, that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes I am killed. You got to learn like David did to encourage yourself. You got to learn how to encourage yourself. I like how the proverbial writer said in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 13, he said, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. What does that mean? That if you're happy, it shows up on the outside. But if you're not happy, that also shows up on the outside. It always shows up on the outside. He said, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Yes, sir. Also in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 22, he said, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Feeling bad about things and staying in a sad state can completely break your spirit. And even makes you sick if you're not careful. Yes, right. But when you learn to laugh and find joy in the middle of your trouble, it always lightens the load and it helps you to see the brighter day that is soon to come. I don't know where the light is and I don't know where the end of this tunnel is. But I know when I get to the end of it, it's going to be some light waiting on me now. And we have to realize all of us are going to have our tunnel experiences. How you going to get out of it? You got to go through them. You can't just stop in the middle of it and say, oh, I'm not going to go any further. You just be sitting right there in the middle of the tunnel for the rest of your life. You got to get up. You got to press forward. You got to persevere. You can't just sit there and expect God to grab you by your hand and lead you all the way to the end. You got to learn how to push yourself. And encourage yourself in the word of God. Now, even Jesus told Paul to be of good cheer, even though he was in prison. Come on now. Locked up, they wouldn't let him out. Yeah. Acts chapter 23 and verse number 11. It said, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. Yes, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. What was he saying? Paul, Paul, don't hang your head down. You're not going to be up in here forever. I still got work for you to do. I still got something for you to do. So don't worry. It's all going to work out for the good. And Paul learned to see that even more good things could come from his imprisonment. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, he said, But I want you to know, brother, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has been evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are not a man, but my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. When we look hard enough, church, you can always find a reason to be glad. You can always find a reason to be of good cheer. You remember the song, uh, Count Your Many Blessings. Yeah. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Now the thing with that is, you can't count them all. No, you're not. this, you know, we just started right now and started counting blessings. We'll be here to Jesus came back. And if we start counting out all the things that God has done for us, because y'all don't recognize every time you put one foot in front of the other. Every time your eyes are able to open and close, that's a blessing from the Lord. Every time you are able to open your mouth and you can allow speech to come out, that is a blessing from the Lord. Everything that you do is a blessing. Because apart from God, you can do nothing. I like how he describes us that he is divine and we are the branches. You go out there and tear a vine off a branch, what's going to happen to you? 
it's going to die. It's going to die because it's no longer connected to the power source. We got to stay connected. We got to stay connected to Christ. We got to stay connected to Christ and to his word. I like what David said in Psalm chapter 68 and verse 19. He said, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Let me read that again for somebody. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. The God of our salvation. Every day God blesses you with good things. And we need to remind ourselves of this and rejoice in our Lord daily that he is involved in every single one of us. And that's what I love about God. That he's so big and bad, Campbell. He ain't just got to take time to worry about you and what you're dealing with and put me on hold and get to me when he get through. But he can deal with you. He can deal with you. In closing, I've never made a fortune, and it's probably too late now, but I don't worry that much, I'm happy anyhow. And as I go along life's way, I'm reaping better than I sow. I'm drinking from a saucer because my cup has overflowed. Oh, bro. Haven't got a lot of riches, and sometimes the going's tough, but I've got loving ones around me, and that makes me rich enough. I thank God for his blessings and the mercies that he has bestowed. I'm drinking from a saucer because my cup has overflowed. I remember time when things went wrong. My faith was somewhat thin. But all at once the dark clouds broke and the sun peeped through again. So Lord, help me not to gripe although the roads get tough. I'm drinking from a saucer because my cup has overflowed. If God gives me strength and courage when the way grows steep and rough, I'll not ask for other blessings. I've already been blessed enough. And may I never be too busy to help others bear their loads. Then I keep drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. I don't know about y'all, but I'm living off of the overflow. I'm living off of the overflow, Deacon Campbell. I'm, I'm living off of the overflow of the blessings of God. He says in Psalm chapter 23, we know it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What you want for anything when God is your shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Making me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Then what happened? My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. forever. David said, you know what? I'm going to have to walk through the dark sometimes. Everything ain't always going to be everything. Not always going to work out how I want it to work out. Some days I'm going to be hurt to my core. Some things are going to happen that's going to tear me up and it's going to take time for me to get over it. You can't get over everything in a night. Sometimes it's going to take you a long time. As you said, sometimes it takes you a while to get through this stuff. But even through that church, be of good cheer. Yes. The child of God has all the reason in the world to hold your head up. Yes. And no reason to hold your head down. Amen. You have all the reason to hold your head up because he told you, be of good cheer. Not because of what you've done, but because I have overcome the world. Amen. And he says that, you know what? If your faith is truly in me, and if you truly believe in what I have done and what I have the power to do, that ought to be enough for anything that you're going through. So church, no matter how bad it seems, it ain't really that bad. No matter how rough the road gets sometimes, it's going to smooth out after a while. No matter how 
part the rain is falling, after a while that cloud is going to give out. And guess what? The rain is going to stop falling. But while it's going on, be patient. That's what it's producing while you're waiting. It's producing your patience. Because guess what? What you're dealing with now is nothing. Because if you can get through that, Something else is coming along down the road. Yes, and all of that is a part of God crafting us, crafting your faith. He's working your faith. The only way your test can be proven is if it's been tried. Yeah. Oh, I have faith. Has it been put to a test? Oh, you, a student can be in a class and say, I know everything. You know a student can be telling you, I know all of it. You can't tell me. Give them a test. <laughs> you, you, you say you know this material You say you know this stuff Here take this test and I can tell what you know I wonder what God sees What, what our grades look like after we get out of our test what, what our report card look like when we bring it home to the Lord What, what kind of grades we got lined up Are we passing the test Or are we failing Come on now. Come on now. Be of good cheer Amen. Hold your head up Don't hold your head down Yeah no matter how hard it seems, yeah. it's all going to be over. What we say in that song, cry your last tear. Because it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Some of y'all can say right now, man, when I was going through it, I didn't think I was going to be able to smile again. When I was going through it, I did not see how I would ever be able to have any kind of joy again. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I thank God for my having gone through it. Because me having to experience that, what did it do? It helped me to increase my faith. Yes. And it produced patience. So now I can sing the song, I don't mind waiting. Come on, yeah. I don't mind waiting on God because I know when he shows up, things are going to be made better. It's going to be made right. So while I'm waiting, I'm going to keep a smile on my face. I'm going to hold my head up high. And I'm going to wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer. Amen. If you're here this afternoon and... Um, maybe you do not know the Lord as your personal Savior. Maybe you're watching us via live stream and you are not yet a Christian. You have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. You come by hearing his word, believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism. Have your sins washed away, done away with, never come before you. And this life, neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. And at that point, you have the opportunity to remain faithful unto death. And as the Bible says, the Lord will give you a crown that will never fade away. Maybe you're here this afternoon. Maybe you're watching. And you're standing in the need of prayer. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail much. And I know, I, I don't have to guess it. I know we all stand in the need of a little prayer. But if you're standing in the need of prayer and you, speak, and you see the need to make that known here on this afternoon, you have that opportunity to do so now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. No, do not let the word depart and close our eyes against the light. Oh, spirit of heart and not your heart, be saved, oh, tonight, oh. Minister Sweetwater Church of Christ. I'm here with Minister uh, Peterson. I want to introduce him who's doing the pulpit preaching here for us. Okay. Hi, Brother Javante Peterson again, minister here at Sweetwater Church of Christ. we just like to take this opportunity to thank you for visiting us. We pray that you were blessed by the worship services. And if by chance you have any questions, we pray that you reach out and contact us so that we can answer any biblical questions that you have. For any Bible question that you can bring, we'll be sure to give you a Bible answer. Remember, morning Bible class starts on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Worship service begins at 10. Afternoon service begins at 6 o'clock. And then midweek Bible study begins at 7. We pray that you come out at any given moment. Come out, worship with us here at the Sweetwater Church of Christ, where the gospel is preached and the water is sweet. God bless you. God bless you. In this so sinful world, my time is running out, and the devil won't quit. He's trying to blind my eyes. 
the light of my life But something is sustaining me Deep down within my soul My word is in control And I know it won't be long Till he comes and takes me home I gotta get ready for that day I don't wanna get left outside the gate It's my prayer, it's my plea With you is where I wanna be 